All right. Um, we'll get started with our 2.30 panel on rights, licensing, and access best practices. I'm Peter Kaufman from the Center Teaching and Learning at Columbia. Um, uh, I will dispense with the usual ponderous Brezhnevian introductions um, that these gentlemen um, are owed. Um, and also, I think, as they say about our senator, Charles Chuck Schumer, one of the most unsafe places to be is between him and a television camera. And I have a feeling that it's a very dangerous spot to be between these gentlemen and a microphone, preventing them from gaining access to it to expound on some of the best practices uh, across the board for MOOCs and online learning and education more generally. Um, to my immediate right, who will go last, uh, Jack Bernard, Associate General Counsel from the University of Michigan. Um, to his right, uh, Matt White, uh, Executive Director of Axel, uh, uh, commercial licensing company, and formerly Executive uh, Director of the American Archive uh, for Public Broadcasting, one of the most innovative initiatives in the field of educational broadcasting ever. And to his uh, right, Kyle Courtney, uh, copyright officer at Harvard. Uh, I believe that, Kyle, y you may have some remarks to begin us, yes. uh, I'll start us off. So hello, let me see if I can get this to work right. Yes, OK. So about just about three years ago, uh, we decided to jump in feet first into this uh, MOOC world. And one of the first questions I got <laughs> in my role was like, so I'm just going to upload my slides, and you'll take my classes, right? Um, and that's pretty much sums up kind of the rights understanding of a lot of the folks when they first get involved in MOOCs, this concept that uh, it's, you know, it's the same as me teaching when it definitely is not. Um, and I'd like to discuss a little bit of the fair use side of things, which we have employed throughout um, various edX partnerships over the years. I'm actually summarizing uh, a report of the edX Library Consortium, which is a group of edX partners from around the world, to see what best practices are being done in these arenas. Now, in the US, we have fair use to rely on, which I'll talk about which gives us a little leeway. But the protections that exist in the classrooms that we take for granted, that we can show a, you know, a New York Times crossword puzzle or a, a New Yorker cartoon, just to kind of have this aesthetic mental break, um, we try to stay away from that in the world of MOOCs because, again, we're distributing potential third-party materials, whether it's movie clips, uh, cartoons, art, music, uh, to you know, tens of thousands of folks that aren't necessarily our students. And so we have to change the dialogue um, in discussing copyright. So we have tried all sorts of different things in this arena, and I want to talk about a couple of them. Uh, the areas of focus that we went on is, is for presentation materials and syllabus materials. In the world of copyright and in the world of teaching, we think those are the two areas where you're most likely to use something else. Um, how would we have an art class on Picasso without showing some Picasso? How could we have a class about jazz without hearing some jazz music? So it's built into the educational narrative that we should be able to use some of this. Um, so we, we discussed two tracks. I'm going to be focusing on track one, presentation materials today, some of the best practices that we've seen um, from some of our partnerships. But presentation materials are what you would appear in your slide deck, uh, whether or not it's films. Uh, movie clips, uh, images, et cetera. Syllabus materials, the readings that are assigned for your class. You know, if you can imagine a syllabus, we handled differently. That was more permission-based or let's make a deal with the publisher or try to get a free chapter or, you know, link through something else. So that, And that's because I think the, the, the nature of e-reserves and syllabus materials is still in flux in the United States with a number of uh, litigation cases. So what we talk about here particularly is this idea of well, if I'm going to use this third-party material, if I have a jazz class and I want to listen to some monk, how much can I use without necessarily going over the line? And what do I mean by over the line? I mean staying within the parameters of what we perceive of as fair use. Now, fair use is part of the Copyright Act. It's a four-factor um, 
um, the statute, I don't want to get too much into it, but the concept here is that you lose a lot of the generous protections once you leave the classroom. Again, MOOCs are outside of the traditional classroom. These are not even paying students. But we also don't want to pass the cost onto them either for either syllabus materials or permissions and rights. You know, if we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to show a certain amount of movie clips, et cetera, well, we don't want to necessarily absorb that cost. We don't want to pass it on. So can we tailor our classes to take advantage of what we call fair use, or as I'm going to introduce, transformative fair use, without stepping, again, over the line? And again, we are rights-focused here. As I said, fair use is this four-factor test. But Lately, we have seen, at least in the last decade, the courts have come up with this notion of something being transformative has a great effect on the outcome of whether or not it is a fair use. And what do I mean by transformative? Does it look at the object and examine the object and that you are talking about the object in a way that is different than the original purpose? I'd like to think of one of the great cases about a Grateful Dead posters. The poster's purpose is to sell tickets and promote a concert. But when you're doing a scholarly study of it and you put it in a book and you make a thumbnail version of it and maybe you can't license it or they refuse to license to it, well, you're using it for a scholarly study of a particular subculture of music and you're not using more than necessary. So you should be able to use that under the fair use because you're transforming the original purpose. So we ask ourselves, when we put a movie clip, a film clip, et cetera, inside a class, is it transformative? Does it transform the material by using it for a different purpose? And a lot of the times in the educational context, sure, you're examining a poem, you're examining a movie clip, you're making some sort of pedagogical point that's different than the original purpose of the film. But it's not just about what you're using it for, it's actually how much and that's an important thing, how much you're taking. That's actually very much part of the fair use code, but in this idea is, is your use appropriate to this new purpose? A lot of times we have people like, oh, I wanna show the last five minutes of X movie. And I was like, five minutes is a long time. Is it necessary to see all five minutes in order to make your pedagogical point? Can you trim that film clip down? Can you trim that music clip down? So they hear the part, or they see the part, or they look at the art piece, and they get the point that you're saying without necessarily having to take too much. Now, sometimes you need the whole 30 seconds. Sometimes you need the whole minute. It depends. But again, is it appropriate to that new transformative purpose? And then some schools have even gone beyond that and saying, is it absolutely necessary to the point you're making? Now, that's a very hard thing to tell someone that's teaching. Is this image clip, whatever you're using, is it absolutely necessary to your pedagogical point? Can you make the point without seeing it? I always like to discuss uh, Einstein course. So if you're learning the theory of relativity, you're doing the math, you're crunching the numbers, do you need to see a picture of Einstein, especially a copyrighted picture, in order to learn the theory? No. It's absolutely not necessary to see what he looked like in order to study his theorem. So the idea that you should remove anything that's not absolutely necessary. And that gets down to the core fundamental notion of what a MOOC should be. It should be engaging. And we think that there's a double-edged sword here. We're not you know, making professors chop out large, important parts. We're saying, in order for you to include this third-party material under transformative fair use analysis, you have to show that it is absolutely necessary to include this. And that will actually make a more engaging MOOC. If you understand as the student, oh, I'm seeing this because it's very important. Obviously, it's important here. He's talking about it. He's analyzing it. He's critiquing it. Then great. Fantastic. We shall include that. We're going to make sure it's an appropriate size. We're going to make sure it's transformative in nature. Now, there's a spectrum of transformative fair uses that exist around there. You know, um, Very weak to very strong. Um, we've seen this over time. What's important is, one of the main things is, is it the material, whatever, movie, music, film, clip, et cetera, is it the subject of the instructor's analysis? Because again, if you're just putting a cartoon slide in for a mental break for the class, that's, it's not necessary. You don't need that cartoon in there. You don't need that joke in there. I'm not saying MOOCs can't be humorous. <laughs> they absolutely can be, but the idea is that if you're going to use a copyrighted material, um, potentially you don't want to include that. 
Um, but if it is absolutely necessary because the instructor is critiquing it, al analyzing it in some way, explaining it, interacting with it. I've seen MOOCs where they actually stand in front of the image and they circle it and they're interacting with it in some way to make a certain point. That's fantastic. As long as it's being repurposed and there is no substitute, including by the instructor. Now, what do I mean by substitutive? I've seen classes of peer institutions where they want to report on a particular case and talk about the case. They find a CNN clip that talks about the case in a minute and 37 seconds. That's substitutive though. We're substituting the lecturer doing his own summary of this particular fact pattern, this particular case, versus having CNN do it, which was full of copyrighted materials, images from other things, things we couldn't necessarily run down or get clearances for, because it was just chock full of information. We don't want it to be substitutive. We want the instructor to do their own messaging and teach their own class. The third party images and music and film can be part of that message, but again, they have to be absolutely necessary. And again, not aesthetic, or like we refer to as window dressing. Background music was a huge problem when we first started. Background music, you know, usually somebody has produced that. <laughs> they sell it to you, there's a licensing. They want to make an engaging and uh, worthwhile presentation. You know, it's media savvy. But background music can be something that costs money and it's licensing and most certainly does not fall under a fair use. It's, it's window dressing. It's nice to have, but it's absolutely not necessary. Now, we have had, you know, courses on, you know, sim uh, you know, music, orchestra, symphonies. Of course, that would be a little bit more necessary. A comparative analysis of uh, all the different versions of Bach that have been recorded since wax cylinders to the present and comparing those different sections. We can see how that's a transformative use. We do something um, from time to time, at least something I recommend, which is called goal posting. Now, this is, I totally made this up one day, and so this is my original idea. The idea is that to enhance a transformative use, you have to be able to explain it in some way, and you have to let the user know this is important. All transformative uses are judged in context. I can only know that something is critical to the teacher's analysis if she says, this is very important, we utilize it, and then we say why it's important again. Goal posting the argument. So I, I like that you talk about, I'm about to show you an image, a music, a film clip, et cetera, and here's why. Here's why it's important. Here's the point of the lesson. Then you see, hear, view it, and then afterwards, did you see what we just did? That's comparative to what I have been teaching this whole time. Um, Greg Naj, who, who teaches uh, the Greek hero in 24 hours, is an expert at this. He includes small film clips because he's doing a comparative analysis of you know, what happened in ancient Greece in the modern context. Uh, he's used many different uh, clips and visual things. One of my favorite ones is uh, the comparison of The Shining with the elevator. I, I wasn't going to run it here, but the elevator opens and blood comes off, right? And this is the idea of a cursed house. And his theory is that it goes all the way back to Greek uh, myths and the idea of a cursed house reflected in the modern context is in a Kubrick film. Now, I also told him I wouldn't necessarily punish him because Kubrick turns his camera very slowly. And so, you know, every single second that we're going over, is it the amount necessary for that transformative use? But these concepts of introducing that is, is interesting. But we also have the concept of substituting it out. So, you need a picture of a red car in your MOOC, you need it really bad. Do you need to use an Associated Press copyright 2011 version of that red car? Especially if it's aesthetic? No, absolutely not. Let's find a public domain version of it. Let's find an open educational resource of it. Let's go to Wiki Commons and see if someone has uploaded a picture of a red car and marked it Creative Commons CCBY, which just requires attribution. That's the copyright holder saying, please, I, I want you to utilize this. This is a license that I'm sharing with the world, just please. Make sure you attribute it to me. So we do actually go through, um, and the, the group that does this at Harvard is called the Copyright First Responders, um, the CFRs, and we do work with this area because we'd prefer to A, use something that's Harvard owned if we're at our institution or any other edX institution, to try to substitute for something that's in public domain, an open educational resource, or CCBY, and then three, if it has to be something that's copyrighted, then we have to apply this transformative use factor. And if it doesn't work, then we don't include it. 
you know, we, we pull it out. We want our MOOCs to be strong, both in content and teaching ability, but also within the bounds of what we consider legal. And so that's a very fine line, but between the 100 or so edX partnerships, there are developing best practices around this area. So I will not take up more time than I'm allotted. That's Jack's job. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I'll be happy to pass this on to Matthew. We're going to save all our Q&A for the end, I believe. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm going to have a very different approach to the subject than you just heard from Kyle. Um, I know, but I mean, it, it, it is, uh, it's fascinating to me that, that the way you can interpret best practices as they're coming out is a way not to spend any money on licensing, <laughs> you know? And um, what I want to help you understand today is that there is a, there's been a universe of, of people who have control of, of uh, rights to material working with creative communities over time. And it's been happening for, you know, a hundred years. Um, and so in this, this, um, this world where there were films and televisions that were made, I mean, no filmmaker or television producer wants to spend any more money than they have to, um, but they, they created, you know, very strong dialogues with, with, um, uh, with archives in order to be able to use those archives uh, in, their, in their programs. And the other thing that they did by paying money was that they allowed media companies and others to set up units that service them and service them how they wanted to be serviced. So people can call a footage company if you're a television producer, a movie producer, you're gonna get somebody on the phone, that person is gonna have some way to create a master material for you, they're gonna get it to you overnight, it's a whole world. And it's existed for a long time. Um, and, you know, the, the transition that I see happening right now in, in higher education is that there is a, um, you know, there, there's a whole, whole amount of production work, serious production work that is beginning and is gonna go on for a long time. And so I think that as this transition moves forward, as you start to get to a place where there's either revenue that is generated by the materials that you're creating or it has big massive audiences that you wanna reach and there's things that you wanna do that don't have a fair use argument that can't pass what is happening over here, um, then there needs to be a way to create a dialogue with some of these, with these uh, rights holders. And you know, you talk about movies, and I think movies throw everything off track because you know, movie studios and their archives are in really good shape. And I got into the footage world back in 1986. And it was around that time, a little bit before, that home video came in and cable television came in. And they created revenue streams that allowed those movie studios to take care of their archives. Before that, Everything was beat up. They, they could put a couple people in the archives to take care of stuff, but there were hardly people to answer the phone. Um, and a lot of stuff got really beat up. You know, they weren't caring that much about it. But once they changed their own identity from, from groups that create movies, from being movie makers, to people who control libraries that they can sell and make available in all kinds of ways that they do today, then they put a lot of money into those archives. Those archives are gorgeous. And you know, the people that are running them have really high-end um, uh, budgets to be able to make sure that that is in the best possible format. It's preserved for all time. It's their responsibility to do it, and they can make money from it. But that's unique. You know, The movies and the television shows are unique. There's an en enormous amount of nonfiction material out there that doesn't have that same status. And so the cure, the care of these materials, you know, really falls on, on archives. A lot of, you know, there's a number of nonprofit archives that are getting grants to do preservation work. Um, and then there's a lot of these commercial archives that are out there that are using the money that they're able to get to maintain these units and to ultimately get material that might be an analog form right now into digital form in the future. And that's the big challenge that we've got right now. Um, Peter was talking about how um, recently I was the executive director of the American Archive, uh, which was a position at the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. And my job, with the support of Congress in a huge way, was to make sure that the 
intellectual properties, the media, the, the materials that were created by public broadcasting, television, and radio would be preserved for all time. That this was created with taxpayer money, it was the, the government's responsibility to make sure that it didn't just sit there, rot, and die. And so when I walked in there in 2010, it had a big, full head of steam, and we had um, you know, groups that were, that were putting you know, $100 million in the name of the American Archive to start doing this work. It didn't all go into the preservation. It went into a lot of things around content. Um, but within a very short period of time, they, within a couple of years after that, they pulled the plug, and the money stopped. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot that goes into it. And, and uh, one of them is, is that the availability of digital video in terms of the, the um, you know, people uh, who, who think about these things is there. They go to YouTube, they see an archive. They're happy with that archive. They don't necessarily have a need to extend beyond that. So UNESCO has, has estimated there's 200 million hours in Europe and America that have digital uh, I mean, sorry, that have analog materials. 200 million hours of analog materials. 10% of that has been digitized. So 20 million hours is in digital form, and that's a lot. And the general public thinks everything has been digitized. But that means 180 million hours are still sitting on shelves somewhere and are you know, looking for some way to get into the digital conversation, or they're just going to they're just going to go away. Um, so the so one of the things that I started thinking about after I left the American Archive was how we can build some commercial models that will actually help do this, that will, in the way that movies found home video and cable, you can have some way here that can take care of archives. And I think the academic community is the one that really should be thinking about this and thinking about how, many, how money does go into these archives. Because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if this is gone, you know, if it doesn't exist anymore, it's, it's just, you know, it's problematic. And it's certainly problematic for scholars. There's a lot of knowledge in these archives that hasn't come to surface yet. And um, so it's a, it's a point in time that I think the academic community should be thinking not only how do I not pay archives for something I'm, I'm doing on a fair use basis, but also how can we contribute to this process that is, is really... Um, is really on top of us right now, and where so much film is starting to, to go away. Now, um, so what I, so I'm, I'm doing a number of things right now, and one of them is I'm the executive director of Axel. Axel is an organization which is the Association of Commercial Stock Image Licensors. I started, I helped start this organization in 2003. At that time, I ran the archives at National Geographic, and we wanted to put together those groups who had built units to serve creative communities and who, who had licensing fees that they, they, that they needed to sustain that to be able to stay open as a business. And around half of the groups that you see up there are you know, arms of media companies like CNN, WGBH, you know, it's a part of the larger WGBH, uh, Ina's French government. But an awful lot of the ones, around half of them, are started by entrepreneurs. Uh, that love this stuff and see a way to be able to move forward. Global Image Works there at the top, it's a researcher who started that company, a very successful researcher, who realized there were all these archives out there in, in, in the world that weren't even known here, and so that she started to work with them to be able to bring that material into the, um, into the creative community. Reeling in the years is a guy named David Peck. He might have one or two people working with him, and somehow he finds libraries like the Merv Griffin Show, and he puts the money into taking two-inch quad tapes and turning them into um, you know, digital files, ultimately, and being able to license them to people, things that just were inaccessible otherwise. WPA is a company I started. It's, it's still uh, you know, going on right now. So you have a mix of these people. And as I said, this community has been serving creative communities for a long time. You know, generally, they all get along really well. You know, People want to get into an archive, and they want to create something like you know, Stanley Nelson just made the Black Panthers film. He knows exactly what to do. He knows who to go to. He knows the researchers. He's going to use some fair use arguments for some of the material he gets in there, but an awful lot of that material he's going to license. He talks with those people about the project. He talks to them early. They work out different, you know, components, and they, they do stuff. So if the academic world wants to really mine these archives and get to a point where they can do productions of ambition that are going to go out to audiences who will love them, 
there has to be a way that there is, 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 is a, a, a true association between academics and these archives. Now, um, this is a picture of me when I started the WPA Film Library back in 1986. This is my partner, Stefan Janssen. You know, we took a bunch of films on a train out of Hollywood. It was this color stock library. We moved it to Chicago and, and started a business. And we were lucky at that point that cable was creating, um, you know, channels like the Discovery Channel or A&E that wanted archives. And there was a market for them that were coming forward. So we did everything we can. Now, this is 1986. I mean, at this point, there wasn't, it, 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 QuickTime didn't exist. They had come out with some digital photos, but you can see we're trying to force, you know, films into a digital signal back in 1986. So we, we saw this kind of coming, you know, and it took a lot longer than we had hoped back then. But that was part of the vision. That was part of why we got into this. And we loved the material. And it was, it was great. And you're also, you know, communicating with all of these filmmakers, which is a wonderful thing in the end. And so, um, so we, you know, we worked and we developed a lot of this um, work to, uh, to you know, make our material to bring it out there. One of the archives we controlled back then was the British Pathé News Archive. And back in 1991, I worked over in Pinewood Studios and took their 4,000 hours of mostly nitrate 35 millimeter negatives and put that all through telecines that we got onto D2 tape, digital tape. It wasn't digital, but you know, back in 1991, that was state of the art. And um, ultimately, uh, the people at British Pathé got a lottery grant from their government, and they went through a process of um, digitizing all this material around 10 years ago. And so when YouTube came along and they, they started to see there might be opportunities there, this company, British Pathé, independent of anything I'm doing, this is a company that exists over in the UK, and it's a very commercial operation, but it put everything on YouTube. It took everything. They already had the digital files. They put it all up. So anybody in this room can go search out British Pathé. You can find stuff. Now, they don't allow you to put that into commercial programs and distribute it. You know, that's there for people to see. You have something that's, that's available. That's the, um, that's the good that comes out of it. Um, and, you know, British Pathé, it's, it's something that has been taken care of. That's going to last forever now. You know, it's, it's a lucky archive to be able to, to get out there. But there's huge academic value in these. You know, the, um, there was a woman who worked with me, Nicola Goldshauser, who was doing a PhD in Germany. And she ended up doing her PhD, since she worked in the film archive, on the Eve Pictorials, which was a woman's silent newsreel from 19, I don't know, 1919 to 1930. You know, the, the sound era pretty much ended it. And um, we had all the dope sheets. We had copied every single dope sheet. We knew why they made those things, you know, why they sent the cameras out. We had the budgets for all of those different projects. And Eve was the every woman. It was the time of, you know, the flappers. It was a whole new world that was starting to emerge. And so every single week, audiences got, you know, around 20 minutes of material in silent form from that. She built a dissertation on that. And another woman over in the UK did the same thing. Now, these people had access to that material. But this can get out. You know, it's very hard for this to, to reach into academic communities if it's just sitting there. But through these types of efforts, ultimately, you know, the idea is to get that out to everyone so they can start to work with it. Now, I went to Havana a few weeks ago because we're concerned about the state of the archives there. There's these new openings up, and we had some great discussions. And um, Ina, the French company, has has uh, uh, taken a lead from UNESCO, who considered their newsreels, the ones that were created post the revolution, to be world treasures. And so Ina came down, and they, they're they going through a process. These, these crates that you're seeing are being put together to be shipped to France. So they can go through a process of digitizing them and getting them out. All well and good. Um, it's a small part of the larger archive. I mean, it's an important part of the archive. But it's maybe, you know less than 1% of what's held there. And the thing that you can't quite tell when you see all that is for the summer, this summer, for a lot of it, it's, it's been kept in a place that has no air conditioning. I mean, this is, this 31.9 is, is centigrade. It, it was 100 degrees in those vaults. And it was 62% humidity. 
Now, when they went into those vaults, not all that stuff was still good. The things that you're seeing in those kind of nice, shiny pieces that are going out there, that was what they could get in there. But that whole process, their film was melting, and there was a ton they were throwing away. So unless, you know, unless there's, there's something, and we're working with them right now, to move that ahead, it just goes you know, away. Um, when I was working with the American Archive, there's a huge vault on the public television two-inch quad masters and other material that's there. And this is, this is the, um, the, the vault that that's in. Now, we ended up being able to digitize 40,000 hours of material at the, at the American Archive. It was part, a subset of a million hours we had identified in a larger inventory. And the inventory had revealed two and a half million assets, two and a half million assets film and videotapes that ultimately represented a, thousand, a, th a million hours of material, and we were able to digitize 40,000. That was our core collection. We had hoped to do more, but that's what we were able to do. Um, none of the material you're seeing there is in that digitization because it's all two-inch quad. Two-inch quad wasn't a part of what was able to be digitized, so it sits there. You know, There was a certain part of the collection, this great American dream machine that you know, was, was a big popular controversial show, the precursor in many ways to Saturday Night Live. It had Chevy Chase in it and others. It's, it's been a, a major piece. It, just recently, WNET on their own initiative took those materials out of this vault, put it together, and are, are starting to, to create something with it. But the majority of this stuff just sits. Now you go here, this is the Netherlands archive, same type of thing. The Netherlands government has put so much money in there. They have 600 million, not million, 600,000 hours in digital form, which represents, you know, really a big part of that whole memory and that entire work of the Netherlands. They're very happy. And they were able to make that case quite a while ago. And when you start looking into how people are going to access the, the, the kind of audiovisual history, memory of, of here, they're going to have a lot of stuff from the Netherlands. They're going to have a lot of stuff from France. They're, gonna, they're not going to have much stuff from us. There's a lot of places they're going to have almost nothing. So, you know, different pockets have made different arguments. But even today, they are losing some of the enthusiasm from their groups uh, because uh, the people in the Netherlands look to YouTube and they think YouTube is just fine. And so the, the whole thing that generated that at the beginning was problematic. So, and then, you know, just putting any type of horror picture you can put up there about how films degrade and, and how this stuff doesn't necessarily last. Um, so, there's, so the message is, is there some way that we can build uh, discussions and start to work in a way that the academic community will realize that the work that's being done by these archives, these commercial archives and the others, it's noble work. They're, they're really you know, working against the tide. And, you know, I told my, my friends and members at Axel I was coming here, and they were very suspicious. You know, I had the woman from WGBH, and I'm saying, we, you know, we should start to move forward on these things. And she just says, well, listen, they can just call me, and I'll tell them how much it costs. And I go, well, wait, we can start to do some other stuff. And she goes, well, Matt, you don't understand. I will work. These, these, these universities will come here. They'll, they'll talk about this. They'll want to do these things. We work out some deal. We get it all set. And then one of the people from the university calls one of our board members, and suddenly we're giving it all away free. And that's, that's the dynamic. So there's some, you know, the, the whole way that these archives were beat up in certain ways on fair use, they've accepted that now. They understand fair use is a part of, of the whole context. But things beyond that are beyond that. Am I taking up too much time? This is getting restless. Good, okay. So um, one other project I'm involved with that will you know, show another type of material that's out there and looking for some commercial models to be able to, to pay attention to them is I'm working with the Beatles on a feature film. Ron Howard is directing this right now um, that is telling the story of the Beatles concert tours through the amateur media captured by fans at the events. And I worked with University of Maryland for uh, around a six-month period back a couple of years ago right now. And we set up a, um, a really great crowdsourcing team and research operation uh, working with Omeka Technology, working with their digital humanities group, and did this whole um, you know, effort around the world to find and identify these things. This piece here is the guy who has, he shows the tickets where it was. It's, it's the last concert. It's Candlestick Park. 
but we found amazing things. I mean, not all of it was amateur footage. A lot of it was footage nobody even knew existed, but we found stuff that blew them away. We found music they had never heard before that sounded better live than, you know, a lot of the live music that was there through soundboards and so forth. So that whole effort, being able to go into things that were not on Google, go into things that were not on YouTube, know that there were things in people's basements looking for this needle in a haystack, but being able to demonstrate value in these archives, in these analog assets that are there. What more value is there than you can re-experience a lot of this, this uh, you know, amazing period of Beatlemania through these things? And so um, when we went back, uh, you know, Ron Howard was involved in the beginning, everything was, was it was an archive project. We were working with them. We were trying to repatriate as much material as we can, and we were using crowdsourcing tools to do it. But we found things they loved so much that the Beatles got Ron Howard involved, and they're financing this feature film. It's in production now, and it'll be in theaters next summer. So that's another way to say that, you know, focus on some archive work. Let's see where, you know, here people buy tickets at theaters. They'll do things. And it all chips away at what, you know, is a just a huge mountain of material. We're not going to get through all of it, but you know, there, is, there, are some, there are some structures or some models that we can do in commercial work, as well as in an awful lot of the, of the um, work that is going on in nonprofit, uh, to be able to, to make this, this go. So if I, have, if I have helped you understand what goes on in a lot of these people's minds who are part of these commercial archives that have this material that is attractive to you, um, think a little bit about how maybe there can be a dialogue that starts to go on with these groups through Axel, and Axel's a great place to do it, and this is what Peter and I were talking about before, you know, is Peter and I have both been on both sides of this many times, you know, both on a commercial end and a nonprofit end, but I think there's, there's um, you know, something really good that can be done if we, we find ways to, to really help you get access to this material in a way that is going to help pay the bills for these archives as they're moving forward and allow them to keep digitizing new things that will get into your world. So that's that. Thank you. Well, it follows smoothly for me. So I'm Jack Bernard from the University of Michigan, and I'm an attorney in the general counsel's office there. I also teach, and I've done I've been on both sides of the uh, online learning experience. I've taught and I've, I've been a student, and uh, it, it helped me get a great deal of passion for this work. And I know it, it's probably not exciting to you to be hearing from an attorney at the end of a, a series of talks, but I, am, uh, uh, I, I, I feel like this is wonderful work. It is the intrepid work of, of many institutions, and it's the kind of thing we should all be pursuing for a whole variety of reasons, and each institution gets to decide those reasons for itself. Uh, I, I would encourage you, those of you who, um, who have the opportunity or haven't taken the opportunity to work with your attorneys, is, is to actually reach out and get to know them a little bit, inspire them to be interested in this work. There's a lot on their plates, and the more you can get them excited, the more time you will get from them. So I love this work and love being at an institution that finds this uh, a passionate area. I will say that... Um, uh, my institution was the first institution to start digitizing with, uh, with Google um, to digitize our 8 million volume library for uh, precisely the purposes that um, uh, Matt was talking about. Uh, that is, we want to preserve that library because the books are literally turning to dust. They disintegrate after a while, and we won't have them anymore unless we preserve them. So we digitize them, we enable them to be discoverable, and we give access to those works to people who have print disabilities. All of this was challenged uh, by, uh, by the Authors Guild and a number of other folks, and, um, and we used fair use to make the argument that we're entitled to do these kinds of transformative uses. So I'm here today to talk with you a little bit about uh, some law and some practices as it relates specifically to MOOCs, but um, also generally to copyright uh, and um, the use of materials uh, throughout the academy. So um, I, I, I'm going to kick off with just talking a little bit about the law. Uh, I've, uh, my, my colleague Susan Cornfield and I have shown this question to thousands of people. 
um, asking about the purpose of copyright law and whether that purpose is to reward authors or to provide some sort of incentive or to, uh, to advance uh, public learning or to provide some sort of legal remedy for infringement. And if I tell you that only one of these things is right, um, and I assure you only one of them is right, uh, and, and force you to provide an answer, which, which we've done over a period of years. It turns out, I'm not going to make you do this, I won't be calling on anybody today, but um, when I teach, I do. Uh, I, uh, it turns out that only 3% of the public get this right, and this includes groups of lawyers or people who should probably know better. That number should stick out to you for a reason. 3% when you have a 25% chance of just guessing. There's something wrong. There's something amiss in that circumstance. Now, you might be asking yourself how I know that this is the case. I know it because I went to the Constitution, and I found the Progress Clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which talks about the purpose of copyright. There it is. It's right in there. Uh, and we've, we uh, get a great deal out of copyright. Um, you can see uh, this is where copyright and patent stem from. It's the, the section of the Constitution that gives Congress the power to create laws in this area. And, it, it turns out our Congress has created laws in the realm of copyright, and they're really pretty wonderful laws, and they provide fantastic uses for copyright holders. These five uses, they're actually sort of six and a half uses, but I've summarized them to five here. These five uses, these, the uses of reproduction, which is just copying a work, or making derivative works, and derivatives are things like second editions or adaptations, that kind of thing, maybe the French translation. Um, uh, the right to distribute works, uh, the right to uh, uh, have public performances or public displays of works. These are fantastic rights, and these rights enable, uh, they do certainly incentivize uh, uh, artists and other authors to create works, and um, we should value these rights. They're really important rights, and we shouldn't forget them. So don't, don't you forget them. Keep them, keep them in your head. Uh, but still, lots of people want to make uses of works, works that are protected by copyright. So for instance, uh, people may want to use uh, a, a work you've created, or you may want to use someone else's work in, say, a MOOC. Well, it's not going to be an infringement if the work you're using is a work that you author, that you're the copyright holder of that work, or if you've got express permission from the copyright holder, or if the work is not protected by copyright because it's in the public domain or it's otherwise um, not a protectable work like the white pages of the telephone. Um, it could also be uh, a use that you're making falls within some sort of statutory limitation. And I want you to keep this idea of limitations in mind. Um, one example of a limitation is, is fair use, uh, which you heard Kyle talk about. And I'll, I'll say just a few more things about that in, in a moment. But these uses are OK. You, you don't have to license. Um, in, the, in this circumstance. Now, there are circumstances in which you will have to license uses, and it's important to do, the, to do so when you have to. Uh, but when you don't, you don't need to seek permission. Now, what I've just said is anathema to some people. Now, let me assure you, I have to use, this is for you, Kyle, I have to use these images of these, of these two, because I actually want you, you yes, I do. I do. That's Jan Constantine, my counterpart at the Authors Guild. The Authors Guild is who sued us over the Hottie Trust. And uh, anyone recognize that? That is Scott Turow, the author. And these are two fine people. And I'm showing them to you because I want you to see them as people. I do not want to portray these people as the bad guys. They're just people who represent authors and had a real interest and disagreed with, well, my interpretation of how copyright law worked. And they would tell you with some gusto how much I have it wrong. And they, you know, they, they would support themselves. I mean, they would point you to this, right? We've all seen this. You can't skip through this on your DVDs, right? This is a pretty serious statement. There's a lot to be concerned about. And they want you to be mindful of the copyright holder's rights. And they will take you to Section 106 of the Copyright Act. Um, and uh, I want you to take a look at this language and think about it with me. So notwithstanding sections 107 through 122, the owner of copyright under this title has the exclusive right to make and to authorize all uses, including the following. It sounds so appealing. Notwithstanding, that means despite. That's what that means. Despite sections 107 through 122, the owner of copyright under this title has the right to, uh, uh, to make and to authorize all uses. This sounds very palatable. 
The problem is, I made this language up. This isn't what it says in the Copyright Act. What it says in the Copyright is, Act is subject to sections 107 through 122. Not notwithstanding, you'll be able to compare them better here, subject to sections 107 through 122. The copyright holder's rights are not unfettered rights. You don't get to do anything you want to do just because you are the copyright holder. There are actually rights for the public. But we've all consumed a lot of Kool-Aid about this. Uh, why? Because we see this stuff all the time. You know, it's interesting. I have contacted the FBI five times now asking about this. Um, and they will confirm this is their seal. This is their seal. But that little bit on top, I can't get anyone to tell me that they actually put that on there or that they actually wrote this language. This la I am using this image right now. It says I can't use this. I'm using it. Um, it's just fine for me to do so. We, we see this stuff over and over again, and it gets in our heads. Think about this. I told you to think about limitations. Scott Turow has a book called Limitations. Um, and so what I did with this book is I went and I, um, I, you can see a little bit of the cover here. I decided not to show you the whole cover because it wasn't necessary to show you the whole cover. <laughs> Only the title and the sort of the broken rope here. Um, and then I want you to see the copyright notice in there. And if you read that, you will see that it prohibits you from reproducing. You may not, may not be reproduced or use, I mean, they may not be used or reproduced in any manner whatsoever. What are you supposed to do with that book if you can't use it in any manner whatsoever? I can think of a few things. Yeah, OK. <laughs> that, those things that you're thinking of, Kyle, are also uses. Um, so here's the problem. We have been hearing this stuff over and over and over again about how we're not supposed to make any uses. It's talking about copyright like it's a chattel or a, like a piece of personal property like this clicker is here or real property like the space around us. It's not like that. It's not like that. It's a different kind of bargain. I mean, think about this. If you... If, if I am running by your house, let's just say I'm running and I, I really have to use the restroom, I can't just go in there. Like, it's your house. I cannot just go in there. If bad guys are chasing me, I can't seek refuge in your house. I'm not allowed to do that. The law prohibits me from doing that. Copyright is different. It, it has this balance of rights. The copyright holders have rights in Section 106, and the rest of us, we get rights in Section 1, 107 through 128. Uh, 122, excuse me. One day there'll be a 128. Um, <laughs> just goes up through 122. I, I, fair use, I'm not going to go through the four factors, and you already heard quite a bit about it, but I, I highlighted some language in here that I really want you to see. Fair use of a copyrighted work is not an infringement under the law. It's not an exception. It's not, a, it's not some sort of special permission. It's a right. It is a right that we have. Why? Because it's carved out of the copyright holder's rights. It's, it's something the copyright holder never had the ability to do and authorize. So if you don't exercise your rights, you're missing out on something. That doesn't mean you get to exercise the copyright holder's rights, but it's something to just be aware of. So this is my bit about the law. Now I really want to talk about some practice. Um, and realize we are in a new world here with, with practice. Um, pre preparing a MOOC, is, as, as Kyle said, is not like preparing a face-to-face -face teaching class. There is just a lot of difference here. Um, and we need to be mindful of those differences. For instance, it takes a lot of time to prepare these courses. You just can't take the course you've been teaching for, for 30 years and say, oh, I'll just use all the slides that I've used and give the same old lectures in front of 100,000 people. It's different legally and it's different practically. You saw people have the capacity to make 56,000 comments if you were here at the keynote, right? 56,000 comments on the foot in mouth experience that you just had. It's totally different than when it's in front of, say, 20 people in a room. Uh, feel free to point out any time I need to remove my foot from my mouth. Uh, but it's a very different experience than this online experience. The, the humor that you use in a class in front of a, people, uh, a group of people who um, are all in the same region may not play the same way in front of people across the world. And so you need to be more mindful when you're developing these, uh, these courses. Um, I, I want you to think about this uh, framework of rights, this disposition of rights, because this is about rights and licenses and, and um, access. 
you, I think you, this image here isn't a particularly good one because you can't tell whether it's going up or going down, but I thought of this more as a pyramid. This outer circle is the law. You need to be mindful of the law because the law, we, we can't violate the law when we're doing this work. We should not do that. Um, I guess we can, we may not. Uh, and so we need to be mindful of what the law is. We also need to be mindful of what our policies are as we decide about the disposition of any works that we use within our courses. And we should be thoughtful about the contracts that we've entered into. Yes, that's a little bit like law, but it's a different layer than the base rules about the law. Uh, and that's what, how we determine what our, our individual uh, uh, choices might be as they relate to the disposition of a work. So for instance, as you're thinking about um, who holds the copyright, I'm actually just going to put all these out here because it's easier to do that. Excuse me. Um, when you're thinking about who holds the right in a work, you've got to realize that typically the author is the, is the copyright holder. That's the default rule. But there's also, because a bunch of lawyers did this, there's another default rule. There's a second default rule. And that is if the author created the work within the scope of her employment, well then she's the author in the literal sense, but not in the legal sense. Then her employer is the author. So either, either the author is the author or the author's employer is the author. Or the author can hire an independent contractor, which we do all the time, like the photographer at your wedding. Or you can enter into a contract with a faculty member to produce a MOOC. So in this instance, you can be, have both an employee at your institution also be an independent contractor. Typically, independent contractors are the default rule. That is, they're the author. So unless you have a contract that says your institution will hold the rights, that independent contractor will hold the rights to the work um, that she's contributed to, uh, uh, to your particular MOOC. So uh, be, be mindful of that the rights in a contract can change what the default rules are. Uh, so you want to look at those contracts carefully, and you actually want to have them at, at your ready. Understand, actually, I don't, I'm going to just zip through these too, so I don't have to keep clicking the button. But, um, and I don't know why I put four bullets on the top and three on the bottom when they say essentially the same thing. But um, you can become a copyright holder uh, in, in really only four ways. Um, you, you are the author of the work, or someone transfers the work to you in a writing, or you get it uh, through a, a process by uh, uh, being the beneficiary of a will, or through some sort of um, bankruptcy proceeding, or so, there's some other legal mechanism that would do this. This is roughly the same pattern for institutions. Institutions get rights either because their employees authored the work or someone transferred the work to them or they left the work in a will or through some bankruptcy process or some other legal means. This is the only way that this happens. It has to be that intentional because we're dealing with this intangible. So you can't, uh, you can't assume you hold the rights unless you do hold the rights. It's a mistake to assume you hold the rights unless you do hold the rights. So you want to understand that these transfers, the getting the rights um, for the institution or for the individual faculty member or even for the MOOC uh, platform provider, it has to be intentional. Uh, we, we aren't only dealing with our own rights and what happens internally, sometimes we're dealing with uh, external rights, the rights of third parties. That is, we, we want to use materials that are, uh, that are other people's works. So uh, it might be the case that um, we want to use uh, uh, someone's image, say, as I did uh, Jan Constantine's image here. That's her per She's an actress also, on top of being a, uh, a lawyer for the Authors Guild, and I used her professional headshot there. Um, I would argue the use I made is a fair use. Um, I, I can actually make that use without seeking her authorization. But I probably can't use a lot of pictures of Jan in this talk. Um, there's a point at which I would run into a problem there. And if I can't, then I need to find other ways of making the use. I, maybe I could describe Jan in greater detail. Um, I, I could actually commission someone to take a picture of her or ask her to send me a photo. And um, I, I could license uh, use of a photo. Uh, I could go to something that's uh, maybe available um, with Jan's permission uh, online for free, even though I don't go to Jan, and she's put it out there for me to be able to use it. So sometimes we have to seek alternate ways to, uh, to use works. We can't just jump behind fair use every time we're excited about using a work. We need to actually be rational about it. Why? Because we want to be credible. It's not that we won't make mistakes, but I think if we want to rely on making fair uses, we ought to be deliberative about it and, and thoughtful so that we can protect those uses. 
Contracts will, in the end, typically be how we uh, resolve these third-party uses where they aren't making them uh, available for us and it's not a fair use. And the contracts are important. Um, uh, our campuses have tons of policies. You're all familiar with them. They go on ad nauseum on our campuses. You should be aware of what your particular campus's policies are. Many campuses have policies that affect the disposition of rights, not only the copyright, but who's allowed to speak on behalf of the university or use the university's logo or enter into one of these relationships with a, uh, a MOOC provider. Who, um, is it a violation of the conflict of interest or conflict of commitment policy to actually enter into this relationship? What kind of gatekeeping is necessary? Just be aware of your own regime because it can come back to bite you if you're not uh, paying attention to that. Um, so our policies are actually uh, affect the disposition of the work and whether we can use it. Um, finally, I just want to get into contracts here a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say this. The contracts ultimately um, are, they can change the default in the law. You, you uh, want to be mindful of the specific uh, language you use in contracts or the language you're being asked to sign. There are, there's the potential for a lot of contracts which are just a tool to establish relationships between a variety of the parties, between learners and the platform provider, between the learners and the, the course provider, between the platform provider and the course provider, between the, the institution, the course provider, and the, um, and the faculty who are teaching the course. There are plenty of opportunities for agreements. I would advise you to keep them simple and straightforward. Sometimes it's harder to do that, particularly with uh, uh, platform providers that are doing a lot of international work. They can get, they can get complicated, but doing this stuff up front un helps you understand the disposition of rights. I want to talk about two quick, well, I guess it's three slides, but two quick elements here related to uh, things people often overlook in these agreements. People forget that these relationships are not necessarily going to last forever. Have a contingency plan for what you are going to do when things don't work out, when your institution is no longer interested in doing this process. Um, ask yourself, what's going to happen to the works um, uh, when, when they're done? That is the courses. Who will get to use them? Will the, uh, the platform provider continue to be able to use them without you? For how long will you be able to continue to use that work? What about the enhancements to the course? Can you use the French language version that uh, edX turned it into French? Are you still going to be able to use that? These are important questions to understand before you embark on the relationship, and the contract is a place where you might actually address that. Uh, so, so there's the departure of the of the platform and co and co content providers. They just they may separate. It's also true of our faculty. Faculty leave, they get poached, they go other places. Who's going to get to use uh, the course when the faculty member leaves? In fact, the member at Michigan uh, goes on to Columbia. Can she still use the course that she created? Can Michigan still use that course? Well, maybe she can use it, but we'll say you can't use the block M. My advice is be magnanimous with your faculty. Don't, don't tie their hands. Don't, um, don't prevent them from actually doing the thing that they want to do, which is to teach. Even if they filmed it at your school, if they've gone to another school, it's a po there's a possibility to share that. This is about the disposition of rights. Maybe both institutions will continue to be able to use it. Maybe one with some restrictions and the, fa the, and the institution with the other, uh, with, with, with other restrictions. So just keep in mind that, there, that the disposition of rights can be mediated by a contract. Um, I'll just say uh, here, finally, um, with respect to these uh, contract terms, um, r realize that, uh, that there's going to be infringement on your site, like in the forum section. Um, know who's going to deal with it. When a student puts up a link to a textbook that the faculty member authored, who's going to respond to that or to some third party? Who will respond to the sex harassment that takes place um, in, uh, online between students? Who is going to be responsible for those sort of periphery areas? It's a good idea to know. Maybe everybody's going to be responsible for it. Maybe there's a, the possibility that we give notice. This is the kind of stuff you want in your contract, and I'm, I assure you, you can learn the hard way. 
Um, my, uh, my final little bit of notice here to you is to remember to keep accessibility in mind. We all have obligations to make our works accessible. Be sure that your courses are accessible from day one so that, that students who have disabilities, learners who have disabilities, and faculty who have disabilities are able to access the course. Um, I, just a final word from me here, and it really is the final word. I said before that you should uh, think about um, being intrepid, and I think that's true. Uh, be in intrepid, don't be ambitious. You, you, you are unlikely to ever see the USS Ambitious launched as a, as a boat. Um, there is an important distinction there. Every mistake that we've made in like big projects like the Hottie Trust Project, the digitization project I talked to you about before, every mistake we made happened through ambition. It's the intrepid spirit that we want to push forward. Thank you. How outstanding. Um, thank you. So Kyle, um, you know, it's fascinating to see that you are a copyright advisor at Harvard at the same time as your coordinator of Fair Use Week. Uh, at yeah. Harvard, which I guess is strange irony. That. Fair Use Week comes up, according to your, um, according to links from your Twitter feed, uh, February twenty second to twenty sixth, two thousand sixteen. Um, yes. Matt, you're speaking of new partnerships, especially as universities become producers and quality producers. At that, it was great to have you in and show you some of our work as we've been. Um, developing this kind of content. And indeed, the archives you mention, you represent, are our natural partners. They hold so much quality material. And where exactly we might meet in that great big middle, uh, especially when we're not selling like movie tickets to our, to our productions, is a fascinating conversation to. And Jack, I just have to say that since August 2014, as several of you is that a copyright violation? That um, certainly is. Since, uh, <laughs> since August 2014, my daughter has been attending the University of Michigan, and I've been groaning about the tuition payments until this very minute when I think <laughs> that you might be teaching there and she could be studying uh, under you. And so it all, it all evens out, I'm just going to say. Uh, what a great presentation. Let's open it up for um, for conversation uh, with um, anyone and everyone. Any questions? Any comments? I, there are mics down there. I think they, or there's a mic walking around, too. Is there anything, oh, is there anything that you all know? Chris? So my question is in terms of the ADA Title II and fair use with things that are going on in a MOOC. Let's say that I put an article or something uh, or a portion of an article that I have got the copyright for. Since this is public domain in the MOOC now, is this something that we can still modify this article for fair use for a person with a disability to actually be able to access the context of the article? I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, the Chafee Act. So uh, the, the lawsuit I told you about with you know, Jan and Scott Turow up there, uh, we, we just, in the first case in history, defended uses under Section 121, which is the Chafee Act, and fair use for actually making uh, works accessible to people who have print disabilities. And uh, while the context was a, a preservation and search context uh, for making these uses and, and the court defended this, uh, I mean, or, or upheld our, our view, um, it, there's every reason to believe that making works accessible for the purpose of, of learners being able to access them in a MOOC falls squarely within that. The Copyright Act has it, has it in there in Section 121, and fair use, said the courts, also applies here. So I think you would have nothing to worry about in that context. That doesn't mean, however, that you should necessarily make it uh, easy for other people to infringe. Um, so you, you do want to be mindful of how you make things accessible because Section 121 talks about making the uh, accessibility really targeted to the person who has the disability. 
but there are a lot of ways to do that. For instance, you can, you can imagine uh, enabling an article to be enlarged, or you can enable a screen reader to work with uh, the text that's on the screen. In fact, you should be doing that as a matter of course, is putting text in formats that screen readers can access. Um, and also, when, th when there are uh, audio elements, you want to you wanna facilitate being able to have uh, simultaneous text underneath. So yes, you don't have a problem. <laughs> the Hathi Trust, can I ask? Uh, like, um, so I, I know the University of Illinois is a partner in the Hathi Trust. A lot of institutions are. Recently I attended in Chicago a thing that um, University of Illinois sponsored. Talk about um, using audiovisual archives in similar ways that the Hathi, the Hathi Trust is a textual uh, ar archive. And I wonder just if it's fair to ask this question, I don't, I, um, are there lessons from, what was it, the victory or the yeah, absence victory. of a loss? No, or no, victory, definitely a victory. Yeah. Victory uh, uh, in the Hathi Trust decisions that, that, that apply directly, indirectly are there any distillations that apply to the, the world of MOOCs in, in particular? Um, um, you, 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 you hinted at it with the amb ambition and an intrepid visit, but are there, are there things that we can take from it, either to enhance our intrepidness or um, <laughs> modify our ambitions? I, so I guess I'll say a couple of things. First, the place, uh, the place I thought you were going was to ask a little bit of, about how, w what the best thing we could do is to support what, what Matt talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and That's I think, y I would say the first thing to do is really to cultivate the interest of, res of, of for wealthy for-profit companies that are actually willing to invest in turning those, uh, uh, the format, a, a, a format that is subject to time into formats that are not subject to time. Um, uh, so that you at least have a backup. I'm not saying not to put film in, in special places and preserve the, the film artifact itself, but I think finding in investors like, for instance, in our case, Google to take an interest in that is, is a great thing. But I think digital is a fine format for preserving uh, maybe a poorer facsimile of those films, but th they wouldn't be lost forever uh, in, in that context. Uh, but along the lines of MOOCs, I think, it's not about, um, it's the work that's valuable. I think people can forget that. It, I mean, it, uh, we won this lawsuit, but there was no party. Um, the, the doing the work was what was salient. And I think having a, an approach of, of understanding that we're in this ecology, that people who produce works and publish those works, they, are, they need they need this ecology to work well so that they will produce these works and will collect them and cultivate those works. And we shouldn't ignore that part of the ecology. I mean, I would argue that our user part of the ecology has been mostly ignored because of sort of the, the fiction that we've all been subject to, that we're, we're confused and people aren't making use as they ought to make. But, but don't ignore the other side of the the balance is what, is what I would say. Be deliberate in the choices you make. Don't get too excited about the project you're doing so that y you uh, ignore the rights of others. If anything, I think that MOOCs have driven in the academic context a lot more freeing up of content that would normally just sit in the archives. I know uh, edX just, lost a, just launched a class recently called History of the Book, and as a result of that, uh, it seems to be a year-long development. We went into the archives, we preserved, digitized stuff. We found funding for it because it was going to push something, you know, beautiful out. The, all these treasures we had inside all of our archives, and we even filmed some behind-the-scenes work of the preservation of these materials. You know, gold leaf looking at a book of hours from you know the 14th century, and so things are getting digitized. Things are being repaired that probably not would not have been a priority until MOOCs came along and, 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 and provided some kind of necessary funding. So those were your questions, sorry. Have a, to have a case study on that may be, really, may be a really fascinating thing for uh, learning with MOOCs three. Um, yes. But I, 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 I 
Lucy. Sorry, I uh, had kind of a question comment. Um, I wonder if you see MOOCs having an effect on um, more international law. In my previous life at NYU, I did a lot of work on trying to get resources to American students who were studying abroad, and we would run into issues like art store is illegal in France, right. so uh, we would have to declare a place NYU property so students could access us, or um, you were not free to order uh, in, in uh, the UK. If there was a UK author textbook that covered the same amount of material, then you couldn't use a US textbook which was hard if the students were going to be completing the semester in the U.S. So I wonder if MOOCs have had any effect on that. I mean, I think sometimes people mm. think like, oh, we have this crazy copyright in the United States is the only place that does this. <laughs> but, but, so I wonder if, if MOOCs have had an effect on, on I mean, and that does hamper, uh, you know, global education and the exchange of ideas. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I do. Uh, so... Some of our partners in edX are most certainly not using fair use because fair use doesn't exist in their jurisdiction. They may have a flavor. The, the world actually doesn't, you know, it's, I believe it's the Philippines, Israel, a little bit in Japan, and the United States has fair use. Everyone else has a flavor of fair dealing, which is much different. Um, it's categorically listed as X, Y, and Z. So we have had some bumps with overseas students, but some of them have been bigger than just accessing potential copyright appeals. Some are like, I can't get on YouTube to look at your stuff because my country has banned this. Uh, I can't give, we had to have that national, uh, the NSA allow us to give someone a certificate in Iran at some point because they had to complete the coursework, but I think they did it under the wire and they can't download it, they can't access it. So we have bumped up against that many different times in many different ways, um, but it actually is, the core concept is, yeah, we want to spread this beyond the states because we have this here, uh, and we have that ability to do that. Um, speaking to the the access for disabled, there's a there's an international treaty called Marrakesh right now that's for visually impaired and for disabled people, which has been put into effect and is open for signature right now, and we're hoping the U.S. will sign on, and if another 14 countries sign on, it will be officially ratified. That's we're trying to we're very big proponents of that as well because that will also aid you know, the spread of, you know, without with skipping through copyright law, saying we should make this available to everyone. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've run into. Let me just add, too. Um, first, I should apologize, because we were very focused on US Absolutely. law. Absolutely. Um, and I know there are lots of people who are interested in other law. The challenge for us is that the moment we leave US law, which is every time <laughs> we put these works on the web, it's 200 other yeah. bodies of law. And so it's, it is difficult to really figure out which parts of those bodies to talk about. And I, I do think MOOCs are part of a, a larger web-based effort to deal with these problems. As the, as the earth gets smaller for this, these kinds of uh, endeavors, we, we are feeling increasing pressure to resolve how we'll, how we'll do this. And I think there's excitement around MOOCs around the world, and I think that will help. I actually think m MOOCs are a way to sort of push forward, because people, there's something they want. Yep. There's, there's the certificate, there's the ability to participate in this robust discussion that takes place in the MOOCs, and I think we'll see more pressure from a grassroots level uh, around the world because of MOOCs. When you license material from a content provider, they can provide you you know, all rights, all media, through the universe forever. Um, so, the, so a lot of the international problems through that go away. Um, when, you're, when you're licensing it from a group like that, they have the ability to do that. NBC Universal can sell you that kind of a right. So it's, um, so there are, licensing can make things easier at times too, it can cost money, but there's a reason. And, and you know, for the, the people who will typically charge you the most, it, they do you the service, though, of being easy to find. It's, it's the, the challenge is sort of the uh, analog to the orphan works problem, is that oftentimes the pieces you want to use, it's very difficult and expensive to figure out and often fruitless to figure out who the rights holder is. But, but I think you're exactly right. And it depends on where you are with this now. I mean, MOOCs in the future may become this massive cash cow for universities, you know, and at that point, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, an incentive to be able to take care of a lot of this through this through licensing. Right now, you're still experimenting, or before it was, it's still finding itself in a certain way. It's like when digital video came in, there was a period where everybody 
everybody was focused on user-generated material so that the material that was in these archives that was, you know, needed to be licensed, people, so I can create the user experience. Doesn't matter what I have, I can do this user-generated stuff. But then that's changed. I mean, now with Netflix and with Amazon, all of these new ones are starting to understand that within creative communities, there is something different that people will come to for audiences. And they are, you know, they're paying the types of budgets that they would have, uh, you know, in, in days way before it. So, so it's that success in certain ways that moves that forward. That's why I talk about the home video and the, and the um, cable television is once they get to that point, then they, they want very reliable ways to work with the best talent, to work with the best material, to not have any kind of ambiguity about what they're going to be able to do in a certain market with a certain piece. Just one last thing. Uh, and those folks that have their acts together for MOOCs are great, but two and a half years ago when I was calling people and they were like, what's a MOOC? Um, one, of the, one of the greatest replies I ever got is, we asked for permission to use something, and they said, I wish you hadn't asked. <laughs> because it's opening up a can of worms inside there, and that they were not prepared. I think they're more prepared way, than ever but, now. Yeah. Because it's two and a half years later, and they can see this as a potential new revenue stream. I mean, so this shifted just in two years. This project that I ended up doing with the Beatles, I didn't have any Beatles content. I mean, I made an argument to them. You say, don't ask. I mean, I could have tried to make a <laughs> yeah, film and fair true. use everything and put it out, you know, and then I, I would have had to, how am I going to figure out to get the publishing rights to the songs and all the other things. But I was able to, um, you know, capture their imagination about what is in these home archives, what might be out there that they would have, and they loved that. I mean, so they, they really supported us doing it. They're financing the film. You know, I don't have any, I don't have to go and negotiate the rights to those songs. They do that, you know, so, and, so. Um, <clears throat> and so there is a value in reaching out uh, to people who control this. There, there's, um, I find it's, it, it, when you get to the source and the, the people who generated that material, that can go a lot of ways. Uh, because so much of the material right now is, is not, con it, you don't have the context. It's just, you know, disassociated media that happens to be found on something. But like when I was talking about that e-fictoral stuff, I mean, those people have access not only to the material, but they can go in and they can see the dope sheets, and they have all this way. And once you, once you start making contacts and, and having discussions with the people who own some of those rights or who are a part of that process, there's an enormously interesting way all of that can go. So two, two things, thank you, um, to close. Um, and thank you for this fantastic panel. Uh, the first is that when um, indeed MOOCs become this massive cash cow for universities, the title of this conference will cover up the L in learn. It will it just be earning, earning, with, <laughs> earning with MOOCs, <laughs> earning with MOOCs. So we'll start parallel tracks: earning with MOOCs, learn, learning with MOOCs. But and I, the second thing is just to say that um, notwithstanding the sort of formal architecture of this whole two-day affair. These topics that are being discussed today are going to be raised in other panels, in other presentations, in papers, in poster sessions, notably in the Open Educational Resources panel that follows after our break. And I know in the Video Production Best Practices panel, um, Stephanie Ogden is on that here from uh, CTL. Uh, ben Wiggins will speak about a new MOOC from the University of Pennsylvania on the history of Hollywood, which ought to be pretty fascinating and can't avoid, I think, any of these. Please uh, join me in thanking our distinguished panel uh, for this. Thank you so much. <laughs>